Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, Joe Stewart, and Janet Lowndes. Janet Lowndes is a Melbourne-based psychologist with over 25 years professional experience, which includes psychological counselling, teaching, meditation training, and yoga therapy. Her studies in yoga also go back 25 years, including time in the Swami Vivekananda Ashram in India. She is a registered senior teacher with Yoga Australia and is the director of the Australian Institute of Yoga Therapy. In this conversation, we talk about her background in psychology, how yoga evolved her approach and understanding of the mind, and how she marries the two worlds together. We also talk about her important work with eating disorders and body image, and how to thoughtfully use language in our yoga classes to help shape a culture of self-love and acceptance. We also talk about how the body-focused aspect of yoga that is presented in social media could potentially be damaging. Now, if you listened to our last episode, I might have mentioned that this week's guest would be US-based podcaster and yogi Ashton Zabo. Now, that episode is still coming, but we really wanted to get our interview with Janet out before the Yoga Australia Conference, which begins the 16th of March. Don't worry, our talk with Ashton will become available very soon. Anyhow, enough talk from me. Here is our conversation with Janet Lowndes. Thanks so much for meeting us today, Janet. My pleasure. We're at your lovely little clinic here near St Kilda. Close enough, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mind, body, well. Yes, that's the, that's the one. <laughs> As we ask all our guests, perhaps you could start by just telling us a little bit about your childhood and where you grew up. Childhood questions are always interesting to ask a psychologist. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> How long have we got? <laughs> How deep do you want to unpack? Yeah. <laughs> like, we don't get to talk about ourselves very much as psychologists. Of course. It's interesting, so... It, you've got to be careful. <laughs> uh, look, I grew up yeah, in a very small country farming area outside Bendigo, a little place called Emu Creek, which often people don't believe such a place exists. There is apparently an Emu Creek on one of the horror movies, but it's not the same oh, one. Oh, what right. about Emus? Uh, no, Emus. No, no lots just of a creek. Emus, but anyway, so I grew up on, on a farm in, the, in a, a large farming family, about as far away from the world of yoga and psychology as you can get. But, but interestingly, growing up in a large family, I think, is exactly what got me interested in human beings and, you know, just uh, observing all my older brothers and sisters and watching the interplay of relationships, I think, is part of what got me interested in where I'm at now really ah and that was of course going to be my next question like how like what got you interested in psychology so what got you interested in yoga (laughs) yeah well the yoga part so often when you meet people who've got both got dual professions like yoga and psychology the question I find people ask me a lot is which came first so for me it was psychology first and I went to university thinking I was going to study PR public relations I wanted to be in something like kind of advertising and promotion kind of work. And in PR, in first year psychology, I thought, oh, this is actually interesting. I quite like this. And did really badly in the business subjects, failed first year economics, did really well in psychology. I went, right, I might ditch that part. Yeah, ditch that boring (laughs) stuff. (laughs) And instead do psychology and philosophy, which was way more interesting. But I think that as a kind of 18 year old growing up in country Victoria, I didn't know really what psychology or philosophy were actually so I kind of discovered them at uni and so became a psychologist and worked in the first in my 20s really in all the hardest work I could find in the prison system and in palliative care with people with HIV and AIDS and domestic violence and I kind of did all it was like I had to jump in which is a little bit of my nature (laughs) and then turned 30 burned out ran away from psychology and said I'd never do it again and went to India to study yoga, which is like, a, it sounds like an Eat, Pray, Love movie, but <laughs> <laughs> wasn't anywhere near that romantic. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it really, it was kind of, I came to yoga as a personal practice in my 20s and then when the world of psychology just kind of wore me down, then I became more interested in yoga as a way of, of life, I guess. 
And so it was kind of part of your self care mm. as you're at work and you're like, I need to immerse myself it was. in this. But at that stage in my 20s, it was still very much one or the other. It's yeah. like I was living this life the majority of the time and then going off to this sanctuary of yoga for like an hour and a half, a couple of times a week, like I think a lot of people are when they start yoga. And it was like my little escape from the real world. And so it wasn't really until I went to India and studied in the ashram that I saw that yoga can be a lot more than that. It can actually be a whole way of living as you guys Oh, nodding away yeah. Yeah. Well aware of. <laughs> so could you tell us a bit about ashram life yeah look ashram i so i studied at the swami vivekananda ashram first in uh, just outside bangalore which is an extraordinary place if you ever get a chance to go there it's a yoga university a yoga hospital and a ashram teaching environment all in the one place wow so it's it's this incredible lived community of yoga thousands of people living there out in the hills and it's just it's quite extraordinary I think so for me that ashram and I I gather from what I hear now that every ashram is different but that ashram was this really extraordinary melting pot of thought and practice and community and and bhakti and kind of everything all combined together which was really pretty extraordinary and so did you research before you go how did you land there I researched a lot and I researched in the day when the internet was very slow. <laughs> I remember, oh, well, I don't know how much time I spent researching, but it seemed to be a lot. What I was really interested in was finding somewhere that I could really study yoga philosophy. So I wasn't drawn to teachings that were very asana based and I'm still not really, but I really wanted to understand the psychology and philosophy within yoga. I knew there was something about that and I'd sort of understood just a kind of 2% on the surface of it, but I was really curious because at that point I wanted to really get away from Western psychology, but I didn't know where to go. So I chose the Swami Vivekananda Ashram because it's a very, you know, there's a, a real jhana yoga there, a real sense of deep understanding being human, which is always interesting. <laughs> as a yogi and psychologist obviously you are fascinated by the inner workings of the mind and that's something that you're really drawn into yeah multiple traditions and viewpoints so did your understanding of your mind and yourself and your approach change the more that you explored yoga philosophy or did the things that kind of resonate with you before that you'd find in the yoga philosophy as well I would say it changed my understanding of my mind and that mind you know humans minds uh, changed enormously when I went to the ashram and first started really studying the depth of yoga because what I learned as a young psychologist from a very western tradition was about I learned about illness you don't as a psychologist generally learn about mental health thankfully I think some of that has changed in the university courses now but when I trained the learning wasn't about mental health and about the workings of the mind. The learning was about mental illness. Like people would come to you in crisis and that's what you were working with. Yeah, and you look for what's broken and try and fix it, which yeah. that totally doesn't fit with my paradigm now of humanity. I think we all have broken places and we all have strong places and peaceful places and we have all of that within us all of the time. Actually, I'll, I'll reframe that. I don't think we do have broken places. I think we have bent and battered and bruised places but I think intrinsically at our core we're never broken where you know we are whole uh, we just get bent out of shape you know? <laughs> or bent into a new shape <laughs> nice. like that. that's very yogic as well <laughs> so actually I think my understanding of the mind totally changed through yoga and continues to be challenged all the time Thankfully, you know, it's, it's nice, isn't it? You learn something new and what you thought you knew was no longer accurate or yeah. relevant. When did you realise that you could perhaps marry the, the Western psychology and the Eastern yoga together? Or how did that evolve? Yeah, nice. You know, that's a good point because when I first, when I finished being a psychologist, I really had a pretty serious burnout here in Melbourne and left psychology before I went to India and worked in, I had a a fantastic six months working in hospitality and I can now make a really good coffee. (laughs) (laughs) So that was really, that was great. And 
aren't they sometimes the best psychologists? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Man, my barista now is one of my best therapists. So. <laughs> when I was in the ashram, I really thought I was going away from psychology and that I would never return to it, that I was done, I was burned out, I was jaded, I didn't believe in the, the system of Western psychology and I didn't want a bar of it. I didn't know what to do next. I knew I didn't want to make coffee forever. So when I went to the ashram, I was still very... I was interested in exploring all these things, but I didn't want to do it for a job. But then I kept meeting people through the ashram who were mental health professionals in India, coming from this total yoga psychology and yoga philosophy perspective. Uh Yeah, and I was really interested, especially I remember meeting a, a psychiatrist there at the ashram and talking to him, and I was sort of gobsmacked at first when he told me he was a psychiatrist and he worked with people using yoga philosophy and and yogic tools and approaches, which I'd never even conceived of, actually, because I still had that idea that there was yoga over here on one side and psychology on the other side. And so I didn't really understand at that point, which I got to find out at the ashram, that yoga is first and foremost all about psychology. And that's really what yoga is. It is a system of understanding humanness. And and I also learned there at the ashram that There is no separation between psychology, philosophy, biology, spirituality, that this reductionist perspective that we have in the West, where we have all these ologists and iatrists and that are very reductionist and carve a human being up into pieces, that I learned through yoga that there is a whole other way that we can understand the the human system and that psychology is part of that wholeness. So I got excited again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was really fortunate. I met a few of those people at the ashram. I had a lot of conversations with them and started thinking, mm, okay, maybe I don't need to find a new career after all. Mm. <laughs> And when you got back to Melbourne from the ashram, that's when you did the advanced diploma of yoga teaching, right? It is, yeah, thankfully. I really am so grateful. Uh, Well, after the ashram, I then travelled into northern India and I did a a retreat with an Iyengar teacher in the north of India outside Rishikesh, which was extraordinary. He had just a small group of us and he taught us at his home and then took us out into the villages teaching yoga to children in some of the schools it was really extraordinary experience and also a really strong physical practice which at that time was totally new to me it's like I said I've never really been drawn to a strong physical practice I'm still not but at that point was really good I really Mm. needed to experience that and to understand the benefits of that for the times in our lives when it's appropriate um, so I, I did that and then I also then went up to Dharamsala and taught English to Buddhist monks for a while and that fascinated me too as another kind of form of lived spirituality to see these people who don't just go off to do their Buddhist thing for an mm. hour and a half <laughs> but are living that life. Mm. Right? Dharamsala is so transcendently beautiful. You've been as well, yeah, haven't you? Oh, yeah, man. it's just, yeah. Ran, have you been? No. Oh, you've no. got to go. Yeah, we'll go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good food too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's always an important part of any spiritual experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, except fasting, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but after the fast, after you start the meal. Meal. <laughs> That's right. So I'd, I'd, I felt that the time in India was not, I mean, the ashram was a big part of it, but also the Iyengar retreat experience was a big part of it, and the Buddhist community teaching English to the monks was an amazing part of it too. So I'd kind of felt that I had so much juicy learning from so many different perspectives. And then when I came back to Melbourne, I felt that I'd had this really interesting mind blowing experience in India and I but what I felt that I needed to figure out how to do is how to translate that learning to an Australian audience and to a by then I figured that I do want to come back to psychology but I want to bring yoga into psychology and in order to do that I really needed a a kind of integrative um, language and way of you know not bringing to uh, esoteric a form of yoga into my professional world. Hmm. So it was then I found the course at the CAE and, and, and like perfect course for that approach. Perfect. Is it you know my one of my closest friends and most respected teachers Lee Blaschke who you had the lovely interview with 
you know, Lee, what he created in that course, as you know as well, Joe, he created in that course a real opportunity for people to find their own inner teacher and to not just parrot out or mimic somebody else's teaching, but to find their own voice, which is what I really needed to find. So, and to find a way to translate all this extraordinary yoga wisdom into an accessible way for the majority of the audience I see who are generally often people who will never imagine stepping foot into a yoga class or a yoga studio. So that course really helped give me, I was going to say it gave me the breadth and India gave me the depth, but I think they both gave me each just in different aspects of the teaching. So they were very complementary. So I felt like the Indian experience was so intense and transformative and then coming back and then having two years of really then studying deeply and figuring out how to translate that transformation into the rest of my life actually was what I needed. Because so I think without that, I might India might have been an incredible experience that lived like a, a your favorite book in the bookcase, mm-hmm. but might never have gotten the legs that it did from doing that two years then with with an amazing faculty there at the at the CAE and part of that course as well there's a lot of written work there's a lot of assignments there's Uh a lot of diary writing like the integration is quite a big part of the course yeah was there much of that in your Indian course no no (laughs) because I can imagine that would be so helpful for clarifying your own thoughts and integrating everything to have to organize those thoughts into a form for other people to read absolutely I think For me, there's that distinction between knowledge and understanding. And I felt like in the ashram environment in India, Swami Vivekananda was a very traditional Indian learning environment, which is quite austere, quite strict, and so full of information. I would say the majority of which went way over my head. (laughs) I'd actually love now to go back and do that course again. I feel like now I've at least got... It's like I feel like I now have the USB slots in my <laughs> Before it was like trying to jam a USB into a power socket in the wall or something. <laughs> well, like such a good metaphor because, you know, every USB you like try it once, yeah. try it the other way and then try it back the first way and then it fits. <laughs> and then you realize you need a HDMI port. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I've been fiddling with computers all week. You can probably hear that. It's not my greatest skill, but I'm learning, right? So, yeah, I felt like I needed that integration and the personalizing of it the self-study I guess is the svadhyaya that that allowed that really helped me understand yoga not just as another science because I know for me if I'm not careful what I do as someone who's been an academic in the past is it just becomes another something to study and academically understand whereas that two years of immersion you know it's, Mm. it's a very different experience isn't it when you're kind of journaling your own time on the mat and you know, your own breathing practice and what's going on for you. I could imagine as well, different from a strict teacher-student environment, just the chance to, like, ask questions Mm. and to share and to hear other people's perspectives on the same thing is such a gift from a yoga teacher training course because you can read that stuff in a book and you can have your own really powerful experiences But if then when you're teaching, the person that you're teaching to just doesn't get what you're trying to say, to have already taken in other perspectives, other learning styles, it's just so helpful. Absolutely. And I think so relevant to how we teach yoga to a Western audience that, you know, the guru disciple model in Australia and in most Western cultures for the majority of students, and I would actually say the majority of teachers actually doesn't work. And so, you know, we don't grow up with that relational pattern, I guess. So I think that coming into the course that I did with, you know, uh, the amazing teachers, Lee and Kay and Josie and Angela and, you know, all these great people, it was really, they they were just people like me, was very much how I, uh, they presented themselves and very much how I saw them. And it showed me that I don't have to become someone different than me to be a yoga teacher either that it's we're really uh, we're no different to our students we've just studied something else and explored something else that they may not have yet but mm, I think that's I that's so great that you figured that out in your teacher training because I think it's such a trap where people step onto the yoga mat and they feel like they have to be these perfect people and yeah. it's like a facade uh-huh. and 
Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I think yoga teachers put that expectation on themselves. Sometimes I think students might like to be able to put us into that position. It's interesting. I'm planning a workshop for the Yoga Australia conference in a couple of weeks, and I'm talking about counter transference in the teacher student relationship. So basically, about how important it is for teachers to, to just watch your own hooks. Mm. And, you know, to recognize that sometimes it might feel nice to be idealized by a student but that's a very dangerous slippery slope it's usually when we're idealized it's very easy then for us to be demonized so it's like well we've got to kind of watch what that relationship is really all about and also are we empowering our students to find their own inner teacher Mm. Mm. or are we just asking them to just copy us Mm. Well, sometimes people really hand their own power and like self-knowledge over to the teacher. Like mm. They'll say something like, what pose should I do for my back? Or what variation should I do? And you'll say something like, well, how's it feel in your back? And they'll be like, I don't know. You just tell me the one I should do. Yeah. And it's like, oh, no, that's not what yoga's about. Right. But see, that's your skill as a teacher, right? That That's great that that's what you would say when they ask you that question. I think that if we're not careful, there are some approaches to yoga in the West that I think are becoming dangerously like allopathic medicine. It's like, oh, if you've got a sore throat, take this antibiotic. And if we're not careful when people say, what should I do for my sore back? And people say, you know, if pain persists, apply this asana. That's not what yoga is about. So your response, what you just said, exactly. It's like, well, some some self-inquiry and some noticing and some curiosity and some exploring and some feeling into it and some listening to your own experience. That's beautiful. Like, I think that's what's really important that we don't just say, oh, just do this posture and everything will get better. What a lot of rubbish. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yoga is not um, a system of fixing things. It's about, you know, strengthening or um, enhancing the wellness of the human system. It's not sort of symptom specific. Mm-hmm. No, if you do look at some of the, I know, 20, 30 year old Oh Looks yeah, <laughs> that there'll be a laundry host of symptoms and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is an interesting point that I'm not sure what to say to that. I want, I have wondered about that. Some mm. of those old books that do read a little bit like uh, for this symptom, use this posture. I wonder whether those books came from a time and a culture of yoga in India where people already had the foundational understanding of the deeper philosophy mm. and practices mm. of yoga. Mm. So then they're really just adding a slight tweak. That's the only way I can actually make sense of that. Mm -hmm. Another perspective I've heard as well is it came from a time where there was a real drive to legitimize yoga as something that wasn't esoteric and Mm. spiritual. It was something like to kind of make it a healing science Mm. or to sell isn't the right word, Mm. but to give legitimacy to this practice. Yeah that was something that maybe the authors of those books thought would resonate with a wider audience outside of Mm. India and it wasn't just people levitating and meditating in caves, it was like a healing system. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense Mm. too, doesn't it? That push to be solution-oriented. Yeah. Mm. And actually I think that's something that's really important to be careful of as yoga teachers, to not just be kind of solution, quick fix oriented. That there is no magic yoga practice that cures anything. That's my belief. I know there are some people listening to this right now who might disagree with me. So I'm just saying this is not a truth or a fact or fiction. It's just my perspective that that yoga ha- has its greatest capacity for healing when it is the key is about practice and regularity. It's mm-hmm. in many ways less relevant what you actually do. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And that really leads us into some of your specialties of yoga and mental health because Mm -hmm. I know that you do quite a bit of work with the Yoga for Depression and Anxiety and Mm -hmm. Amy Weintub system. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that and that approach? So I had the honour of hosting Amy when she was here in Australia a couple of years ago. You guys were there too. Yeah, it was a great great. workshop. It was great. She's an extraordinary teacher and has, um, you know, been one of those people who's been really integral in helping weave this conversation between yoga and mental health professionals. And she's continuing to do that work. And so I, you know, learned a lot from Amy at that workshop and still use many of those practices. I think that what's interesting, though, is that the way I've translated 
included some of that in my work is that I don't tend to talk so much about yoga for a condition. It's more about yoga for mental health or yoga for your mood or yoga for... There's so many reasons to this Mm. because I, I guess that one of the challenges is I just had this conversation with someone today who was kind of, she was in this conflict about whether or not she had depression or anxiety. And she'd been told by one psychiatrist that she had depression, by another she had anxiety. And she wanted me to answer that. And, you know, my response to her was, I said, does it really matter what it's called, right? And I think sometimes it does matter because diagnoses can aid treatment. But at other times, I think if we're not careful, we just get so caught up on the name of something that we're not reflecting on what is the imbalance and you know the the yoga therapy the world of yoga therapy is really very much about not focusing on what the condition is but more about what's the going on in the human system where is the imbalance what are the experiences for that person and I think it was even Hippocrates who said be less concerned with what condition the person has and more concerned with the person who has the condition Because my experience after 25 years as a psychologist is you could have 100 people in the room all with a diagnosis of depression and there's still 100 people who are all different and who all respond differently and who all experience the world differently and who will benefit from different practices. So exactly as you said before, Mm -hmm. Jo, about asking people to inquire into, well, what happens when you do this and what do you notice and what sort of things do you find help to bring you to more balance and what sort of things are more agitating and, you know, then really helping people to develop that skill of self-inquiry and embodiment where they really notice what's going on and then responding to that. So I think... That's a very long answer, but I no, guess... it's a beautiful mm. answer. Oh, and it really comes back to what you're saying about when you left psychology and left that practice of treating diagnosis and treating, you know, symptoms mm. to treating someone as a whole person and helping them feel mm. into that for themselves. Yeah. Mm. Right. So now having come back to psychology with this kind of whole... I was going to say extra tools in the tool belt, but that's definitely not right. It's like a whole new tool belt (laughs) yeah well it's a whole new uh, framework and paradigm and way of understanding human existence I think that we have the opportunity to explore through yoga and I feel like that shift has really helped me be more interested in the whole human system and less interested in the the name of the condition Mm -hmm. like I said that's sometimes still relevant and still necessary but I don't think we should ever lose sight of the person by just focusing on the condition. You've been able to marry yoga into your own practice of psychology. How do you go about bringing yoga to other psychologists? Yeah, that's the perpetual question. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Thankfully, I'm really happy to be a psychologist in a time where I feel like the psychology field is returning to some of its breadth Mm -hmm. in pockets, right? I, and I think this is the same for medicine, you know, that, that what we're seeing in, in medicine, for example, is a rise in integrative medicine and complementary medicine practices and doctors who also have Chinese medicine or, you know, other things in, in there. So they, they are broadening their understanding of not just that reductionist model, but a broader system. So that's also thankfully happening in the world of psychology as well with the rise of something that always makes me smile a little bit, what's called the kind of new wave psychotherapies, which are all very kind of based in mindfulness and more existential teachings. Which Rather than course, dance. <laughs> yeah, and of course, as we know, they're not new at all, yeah. right? They're really old. <laughs> um, but that's great because mm. it actually means that I think there are a lot of psychologists and other mental health professionals who are moving beyond and not leaving behind the wonderful gifts of the more Western systems. There's a lot of we're saving lives in this stuff, Mm. but actually broadening and including that so that it's not, I often say to people, it's not, we are fortunate that we don't have to choose between Western medicine or Western psychology and a more integrative approach. We can have both. That's what the word integration is about, yeah? So um, it's the kind of non-dual perspective in healing, isn't it? So yeah, so I think my interest really in the way I like to translate a lot of the work in yoga for mental health is that 
it's less specific and more about recognizing Patanjali said it best as he said many things best about when there is uh, suffering to try and kind of cultivate the opposite so that we're not actually fighting against what a person is experiencing but we're helping them develop the strengths and capacities to build their kind of healthy self if you like rather than trying to fight an illness which is like banging your head against a wall sometimes isn't it? and it would just make your life all about that illness right good point yeah we actually then become that and it's like even languaging you know i often encourage people to just watch the way we self-define we could say you know i work a lot with people with eating disorders and someone could say you know i'm an i'm an anorexic it's like wow that's that is such a self-definitive statement uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, I, I have this condition or I'm currently experiencing this condition or I'm experiencing these symptoms. It's, it's because it, I think it's really important to recognize the impermanence in all of our experiences, including our suffering. And I'd love to talk to you a bit more about your work with um, eating disorders mm-hmm. and body image yeah. because yoga could be such a tool for healing and yet often I see a lot of disordered body image being portrayed in the media surrounding yoga and I also would like to ask you a little bit about as teachers what can we do in our classes that there might be things that we might not be aware of that are not helpful and what are some of the things that we can do which are helpful sorry long question (laughs) it's great wow we need a day yeah (laughs) Uh, it's a great multi-layered question and I think we are we're in a really new and interesting time for yoga in the west because of the kind of objectification of yoga imagery I think that we're now bombarded with from everything like selling watches to health insurance to cars to whatever you know images of usually young white women with thin privilege on you know selling stuff it's everywhere right and so unfortunately I also I think that's one layer to see it in the world of advertising and marketing what really makes me sad though is when I see yoga teachers buying into that and really objectifying their own body to sell yoga oh I almost said no that's not what I mean but it sort of is what I mean and I think it's really an important thing to recognize for people to really question themselves about the use of yoga imagery and what are they really what's the message they're really putting out there I'm trying to be polite about this Mm. but I guess if I was speaking frankly I'd say I think there's just a lot of people who are really selling out and using their bodies to sell their yoga and it makes me very cross like Mm. I think as well sometimes It can be a challenge to think of an alternative. Say you're building your yoga website. Most of the other yoga websites you look like would be that person looking really slim and amazing doing hard yoga poses. (laughs) So, I mean, there are definitely other options of things that you could put on your own website that say more about you and more about yoga. Have you got some suggestions? Such a great point. You know, I often say that the challenge is yoga can't be photographed. So you can photograph someone making shapes. You know, that's a, a client of mine said that to me once. She said she started studying, doing some retreats and things with me. And on one of the retreats, she said, I used to think I was doing yoga, but now I see I was just making shapes. And she was someone who was a former gymnast. She was excellent at making the shapes. You know, the shapes would, would go into a, a yoga calendar, you know, very easily. But she would started to recognize that in order to actually have a deeper yogic experience, she needed to be less fixated on the shapes and actually to do less shaping, if you like. Yeah, yeah. So I think for yoga teachers, it does actually require a bit more broad thought in this world of visual marketing of how do I market myself and my practice and my business without relying on more of the objectification of the body beautiful. So I uh, look, I don't think there's a, I'm not a marketing expert, so I don't have an easy answer to that. And I don't, I'm also not saying that I don't think there should be any photos of yourself doing postures or whatever. Some potential students are quite motivated by that, but I think it's good to question which students might be motivated by that. 
a lot of students living in larger bodies or students who don't have thin white female privilege are actually likely to stay away from yoga for those reasons. Mm. If they, another client I once said to her, she was not going to yoga because she felt she wasn't thin enough. And I said to her, you don't have to look any certain way to do yoga. And she said, well, that's not what Instagram says. You know, what a sad reality. You know, it's really, I think, thankfully, now we are seeing a bit more body diversity and race diversity, gender diversity, age diversity, all of these things and recognizing that everyone can do yoga Mm -hmm. and that there is a yoga for everyone. But I think for the individual teacher, especially teachers who have the thin white female privilege, right? It's handy. You just wait till you get a bit older and you don't have that anymore, (laughs) right? (laughs) But teachers who do have that, I think that what it requires is just a little bit more lateral thinking about, does it always have to be photos of me? And also lateral thinking about, do I really need to be wearing a bikini on a beach? Really? (laughs) (laughs) I think sand and yoga don't mix, but anyway. (laughs) Uh, To just, you know, think a bit more outside the box about all sorts of other things that might represent yoga and also recognizing that even if it's just taking photos of asana, it's like, well, which that's such a limited part of yoga anyway. But I do understand it's very hard to photograph, you know, samadhi. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) To feel the flowers in a hammock or something, I don't know, but... It, it requires a bit more lateral thinking. And, mm-hmm. and frankly, I think that an, a lot of yogis have become a bit lazy about, oh, I'll just take another photo of myself in some very challenging posture. And again, and you scroll through their Instagram feeds, it's like, really? I've seen enough <laughs> of that. Yeah, totally. It's like if you want to stand out from that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Take a photo of your feet and your dog or something. Mm. I don't know. It's like, you know, there are other things. Oh, what yeah. I've seen as well, which works really beautifully, is take a photo of some of your students. Like nice. with permission, but yeah, great, show yeah. diverse bodies and great. Like you're teaching a class, you're not doing a handstand on a beach. So show that. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. It's. I think that's really true. About if we really think about making yoga accessible to everyone, mm. then you know that's an important thing to consider about diversity and recognizing that. And also, a lot of yoga teachers don't fit that that kind of image of what a yoga teacher is supposed to look like. And I often get asked that question from yoga teachers, like. Well, how about, you know, how it feels for me when my students objectify me or when people say things like, oh, you don't look like a yoga teacher. And, you know, it's interesting because, well, what does a yoga teacher actually look like? And the Yoga and Body Image Coalition, who I'm a community uh, member of, they have a great T-shirt that says this is what a yogi looks like. But it's really interesting. I was running a workshop about this for yoga teachers and this, you know, really switched on young uh, female, you know, fits all the privilege kind of, you know, young, thin, white female yoga teacher. She looks like a yoga teacher and she came up to me and very astutely said, but what would happen if I wore that T-shirt that said, this is what a yogi looks like? She said, wouldn't that then seem kind of a little conceited? And I was like, yeah. (laughs) Actually, you're quite right. <laughs> but I said to her, you know, if you're in amongst a whole group of us and we're and it's showing diversity, then mm. that's kind of different. Mm. Um, but, but I guess that's the point too, that it doesn't mean that people who do have that privilege that they shouldn't, that they should feel ashamed of that. Mm. But I think with any form of privilege, what's important is that we are aware of and careful with that privilege that we, we're careful that we don't exploit or marginalise other people through our privilege. That's a really great point and a really great way of framing that because it can be a sticky issue. Like, it's not about feeling guilty. Mm. That's right. It's not, oh, wow, do I have to gain a whole lot of weight so I don't fit that image or something? It's mm. like, no, no, no. It's just privilege is power. And like any form of power, if we don't recognise that we have it, we're more likely to misuse it. So it's really important to respect it and be more careful and gentle with it. It just requires some consciousness, I think. And so with that in mind, mindfulness in teaching, because I know that not all people who may be suffering with an eating disorder, it's not always visible. Mm. You might not know they're in your class. And there are many people who don't have an eating disorder per se who might have insecurities, might not feel good about their bodies, might be going to yoga for that reason Mm -hmm. because 
they want to work out or so they want to practice that's going to help them feel good in themselves. Mm. Is there anything that you think we could do better as yoga teachers across the board in terms of our languaging, in terms of our themes, things that we might not have thought of that can just help our classes be more helpful and inclusive for people who might have a bit of eating disorder or body image stuff going on? Beautiful. Firstly, I would say it's safe to assume that if you're teaching a yoga class in the in a Western context, that the majority of your students will have some issues of body image. You know, we know that concerns about body image are very high in people's self self critic kind of self talk. So I think that there's kind of a continuum. But on one end of the continuum, it's people who have a totally healthy relationship with their body and are totally comfortable in their own skin. We like to think that that's the majority of people, but, and look, maybe I'm, my perspective is quite skewed because I see a lot of people who don't every day, (laughs) but I don't think that is just my perspective. And research says that's not just my perspective, that we are taught to compare our bodies against ideals from before we even know we're doing it as two and three-year-olds, basically. So I think that it's safe to assume that there are, Probably the overwhelming majority of people in our yoga classes are are dealing with their own issues, some of which might be uh, challenges with their relationship with their body. And so that continuum starts from a totally healthy mind-body relationship and totally feeling comfortable in your skin right through to then body image challenges, disordered eating, and then eating disorders. And eating disorders at the most extreme end, really pleased, as you said, when people recognize that you can't tell by looking at someone whether they have an eating disorder, that in fact there are so many hidden forms of eating disorder that a lot of people have this idea that an eating disorder is just that kind of stereotypical person with anorexia who's lost a very serious amount of weight and is significantly underweight. So firstly, you can't tell if someone's very underweight doesn't mean they have anorexia. There can be lots of other reasons for that. But also, there are, even someone with anorexia may still be in a weight range that doesn't look all that frighteningly underweight because they may have actually started at a higher weight. So it's actually more about malnutrition and degree of pace of weight loss and things like that. And then the other thing is that there's all kinds of other eating disorders. You know, there's bulimia and binge eating disorder. And and so you absolutely can't tell just by looking at someone anything about them, really, Mm. except maybe the color of their eyes. Even then they might be wearing contact lenses, right? (laughs) So it's a tricky question because as a teacher, I think we can only work with what our students present to us. The first thing that I would say is we need to ask. And that doesn't mean that we ask people, do you have an eating disorder? But what I do mean is I'm struck when I run the uh, yoga psychology training with Michael Domenico that we do for yoga teachers. One of the things that I say is that it's very important that we're actually asking questions about mental health on our intake forms for new students. It amazes me how often people tell me that they don't even ask or what people say to me is, well, there's no point asking because people won't tell me. And what I would well, say is... they definitely is, won't tell you if you don't ask. Exactly. <laughs> they won't tell you if you don't ask. But also, even if you ask and they don't answer it, you've immediately told the student that it, that is actually relevant here and I am interested in it and it is important rather than just, well, I'm not going to ask because I don't want you to tell me because I don't know what the hell to do with it. So don't actually tell me. Right? Yeah. So I think that we need to ask openly... And not, do you have an eating disorder, but questions like, you know, are there any health challenges that might affect your practice or kind of broader things like that. So we start there. And then it's also in the way we speak when we teach about the examples that we give that, you know, we might say that if you're finding that you're having a challenging day with you, how you're feeling in your skin or in your relationship with your body, then you might try compassionately putting your hands on on a couple of areas of the body that you want to send some love to or you know those kind of examples where you're straight away saying that I am aware that this might be happening for people in the room so I think there's those kind of subtle layers of it and then there's probably the more serious layers of when we become concerned and aware of problems that might be happening for our students like we're noticing them being very frail or dizzy in class or you know we're concerned about their health and well-being we're not sure if maybe it might be an eating disorder or something else going on and in those circumstances 
I actually think we need to consider our duty of care of teachers, that sometimes we actually need to ask our students for medical clearance to be practising. That's, I feel like that's something that probably requires a long conversation that I think actually one of the things that I would like to see happening is more training for yoga teachers in sort of how to work with people with eating disorders. Uh, it's happening a lot more in the fitness industry now because there's a lot of problems with, in gyms, of course, with people overtraining. But increasingly, I think we're seeing more of this in yoga, that there's lots of people in yoga classes who have often quite serious eating disorders and I think that equipping teachers better for how to deal with that tricky kind of conversation is really important. I'm already thinking I want to go to that workshop. Great, <laughs> Absolutely. well I want to run it so let's put it Fantastic. together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that leads me to something else, say you've had that conversation with a student yeah. and you're concerned about them, you know it's beyond your scope as a yoga teacher, like you really feel like the right thing to do is to refer them on but if you don't happen to know any psychologists Mm. how would you go about building a good referral network because I think it's a bit if you just tell them well I think you should talk to someone yeah it's probably pretty unlikely they're going to yeah good point so firstly I love that you're referencing scope of practice right something that like the ethics of being a yoga teacher or being in any healing modality I think the ethics are just so vital to be very very conscious and aware of And so if people aren't already aware, there is a scope of practice for yoga teachers that Yoga Australia developed and other organizations have their own scope of practice documents. And I think they're really important documents to know, not to just read once and then forget about it, but to actually be very familiar with what are the boundaries and limitations of my role. Because the very reason, the very nature of the awareness that yoga can heal also means that it can harm so therefore we do need to take the yoga teaching relationship very seriously and to be conscious of scope of practice issues so look I think that um, something that's important is that yoga teachers even name that with students like when they recognize that they're approaching the edge of a scope of practice issue with a student to let the student know that because I think some the role of yoga teacher is a bit nebulous for some of our students. They're not sure if that means that we're their priest or their mother or their sister or their best friend or their father or their boyfriend or their, you know, what is it? And if we're not careful in being clear about where the role starts and finishes, people can assume sometimes, often because of very significant need that they have, and they have a need and you're a nice person, and therefore they might want to fit you into that spot. So I need a therapist, you're really lovely, let's make this happen, right? (laughs) (laughs) Let's make this happen for 40 minutes after every single class, right? (laughs) And if we're not careful as teachers, we are nice people, we do care about our students, and we like to be helpful, and if we're not careful, all of a sudden we're doing that. 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour. It's really draining. Really draining, really draining. And, you know, it's not the role, but it's really easy to understand how we get into it, right? So it's like a kind of match made in heaven in lots of ways, right? (laughs) I think as well it's non-threatening for people. Like they already know you as the teacher. And sometimes I wonder if the thought of speaking to a psychologist means that they've got a real problem. Like it's that step further in their own minds. I see it with people with say back injuries and things as well it's like oh no this isn't anything serious I don't need to talk to a doctor about this I'll just tell you about (laughs) it as kind of had to go oh no actually I think this really is one that you need to talk to a doctor about great so you know I, I think that sometimes even just openly naming it like as as a yoga teacher I have this document called the scope of practice and it talks about what the limitations are that I'm legally and ethically allowed to do And we're kind of getting right close to the edge of that. So this is, you know, what I can do now is I can give you some names, I can give you some recommendations, and I can keep being your yoga teacher, but that has a limit and it means that I can't do this next part of what it is that you're wanting. So, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of just being totally open with people about I'm not allowed to do this, this is why I'm not allowed to do this, and also it's not my skill set and, I, you know, it's much better that you see someone who this is their skill set, be it a physiotherapist or a 
psychologist or other mental health um, professional or a doctor or dentist or whatever it is, right? I did once have a student ask me about a toothache. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> Take like, that one to your dentist. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good, but I'm not that good, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea about teeth. Yeah. So I think, you know, firstly I'd say name the scope of practice and let people know that. And you also your question about what if you as a yoga teacher don't have the referral network? I actually think that's something that's really important to develop as a yoga teacher, to find out, you know, to do some research, to ask your other yoga teacher colleagues, like who are some great physiotherapists or who are some great dentists or <laughs> who are some great massage therapists or acupuncturists or Chinese medicine or GPs or psychologists or whatever, and actually come up with a referral list that you keep in your yoga studio, in your phone, wherever it needs to be, so that then when people ask, you can say, well, here's a couple of names for you. I know of these people. The other people that are good to ask is your existing student group. You know, even to tell your students, I'm putting together a referral list so I can tell my other students, if you know of any good health professionals, can you tell me their names? Because I'd really like to add them to my list. Because the students are a great, well, yeah, yeah, a great yeah. resource. Fantastic. Mm. And they vibe with you. So exactly. they're probably going to exactly. have similar people that they see for other things. Yeah. So that's often a resource that I think people don't think to ask. Of course, you're not saying to the student, oh, Mary over there needs a new psychologist. <laughs> Who would you recommend? <laughs> you know, I'm developing my referral list and can you help me with some ideas? People are often, you know, really happy to help out like that. So that would be another suggestion. And I, I also think that sometimes when it comes to boundaries, teachers need to actually be very assertive at a certain point about boundaries. Because boundary violation is a bit of a slippery slope and it usually starts by being too nice. And so it starts by wanting to help. Yoga teachers are, the overwhelming majority of time, yoga teachers are very good people who are doing what we're doing because we care about the state of the world, right? And we want to do our bit to, to heal and to help, mm -hmm. right? It's, I think that's a pretty universal statement. So we're a bit of a sucker then for someone who's in need, right? You know, can't sit on a tram without wanting to help someone. Yeah. I can't walk out yet. So, but what we've got to be really careful of is that we're actually, we catch these boundary slips early, name it early, and, and really kind of recognize when we're getting pulled into the need to be needed stuff. You know, it's nice when people want us to help them, actually. We do kind of like that, but it's really like when we're starting to step outside role, that's where it starts getting dangerous. What would be some great phrases that a yoga teacher who felt like, how have I set up this dynamic that there's always someone who has something they want to talk to me after class? Because I think sometimes it's someone's energy that people are drawn to. Yeah. Are there some easy kind of go-to phrases that aren't going to hurt anyone's feelings. I've got to say, this isn't very honest, but sometimes I'll be like, I'm sorry, I've got another class to get to, so I yeah. can't stay too long. Yep. And we all do that sometimes, you know, there's all the excuses. The, the thing is, excuses work when it's a one or once or twice off. They also work with students who are pretty, pretty perceptive about the boundary Oh, of course, that's right. You've got a life beyond this moment, right? <laughs> You've got other things in your in your life. So the excuse stuff can work sometimes, but what tends to happen is the people who are either the most in need or the least perceptive, or, uh, well, they're usually the two things, I think, that you can use those excuses all you like, and it's still the next time and the next time. So sometimes I think, you know, as I said before, I'm a big fan of actually just having really open conversations, like, you know, sitting down with that person and saying, we need to have a chat about this. What I've noticed is that after lots of classes, we're sitting and having really long conversations. And I've been really drawn into that because I really care about you. But I'm really conscious that because of my scope of practice as a yoga teacher, we're really kind of at the boundary of what it is that I can do for you. And I, what I really want to do is help you get the help that is more effective. Oh, and that's such a better way to handle it than just being like, gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, totally understandable. And the gotta go might work. And when it works, whatever, fine, mm. just use it, I reckon. <laughs> like, we do what we got to do to get through, you know. But I think sometimes what's required is a more honest conversation. And that's a hard conversation to argue with, isn't it? It's like, I do care about you. I, and there's the, also the taking personal responsibility in that. I notice that what I have done is stayed a bit longer each time and it's because I do care about you but I'm very conscious 
that you know your needs could be better served through a referral so I, I think that sort of stuff is really important that we're still really holding someone and supporting them to get the care they need but we're also you know as a yoga teacher I also think part of our role is to help people see their own dynamic including seeing when they are kind of stepping over into taking our time absolutely like knowing themselves being real with themselves yeah yeah and not being aware when they're stealing our time or not being Mm. aware when their uh, jangly jewelry Mm -hmm. is upsetting everybody else in meditation or you know whatever it is it's like sometimes actually I think as a yoga teacher if we're not careful we can be too focused on being nice and by doing that we might actually hinder the person's learning experience yeah I have another interesting one I'd love your opinion on. Mm -hmm. Often there's this dynamic. In my home studio, it's really small. It's three people. So even if people don't know each other initially, often, you know, there's a bit of chat and it's pretty friendly. And just one thing that breaks my heart is the casual body hate. Mm -hmm. Like so often someone will just like grab their belly and be like, oh, look at these rolls. And because I work with aerial fabric, they're like, oh, it's digging into my muffin top. I hate these bits. And then... It's like this group energy. Other people be like, oh, I hate my thighs too. And it's this weird bonding experience of people just hating on their bodies. And it's the last thing I want to be teaching in my class. I want people to feel good about themselves. And I've even said, look, we're all really unique. Like what I want to do here is help you all feel really good in your bodies. Like that's what I'm teaching. And one person was like, oh, it's easy for you to say you're really fit. You don't have any wobbly bits, which is totally not true. But it's like, oh, how do I just turn this around without making this really phony kind of people hiding how they really feel and pretending everything's perfect when that's not how it is? Yeah. Oh, well, I love that you're aware of it and that you're, you know, already thinking, I don't want this to be the culture that I'm enabling. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think this is an issue that's well beyond the yoga class, but it would be nice if people could at least escape from it in the yoga class. But, you know, people sit around and they, they catch up with friends and talk about what diet they're on and whether they've gained or lost weight. I mean, how boring is that as a conversation? <laughs> really? There's so many more interesting things about a person as a human than, than whether they've, you know, what's going on with their outward appearance, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that when it's starting to infiltrate the yoga studio what I would suggest is that that is your space and you're allowed to set whatever rule you like so we have a rule here at this clinic at, at Mind Body Well that this is a no body hate zone oh so, I'm putting that on my website yeah, yeah. Great. it's a no body hate zone so we will not have conversations about body hatred it's like nah not nah, not in here yeah. not having it. No. <laughs> and, and you know when you can be light with it like that and you hear it it's like oh remember the, the sign at the door or whatever <laughs> like, it's like this yeah exactly no body hate because it's and, and really, you know, what we're doing with that and being having a bit of fun with it like that is actually asking people to be conscious of how much of this is infiltrating their life. Like, why are we doing that, hating on our bodies and mm-hmm. objectifying them like that? So, you know, I think why not put up some signs? This is a no-body hate zone. Uh, you know, there'll be no, no fat shaming, no fat talk, no uh, objectification of the body, all of that kind of stuff. And even just openly naming it. Like, look at what we're doing here. Because, you know, really when we think about, again, those deeper teachings of yoga, it's about self-awareness and recognising the the impact of our behaviors and the impact of you know mind our thoughts mind our speech mind our behaviors because they become our our destiny you know so if we're just saying these things out loud to ourselves all the time imagine how much more they're actually saying it in their minds which is really sad but a it's not good for them b it's not good for the other people in the room and c it's not good for you as a teacher i don't want to hear it so i can hear it everywhere else right? yeah <laughs> i want this to be a safe place where I don't have to come to feel ashamed of myself. There's enough of that. There's plenty of other places that can encourage that. Yeah, like this is where you can mm-hmm. cultivate the love and the understanding exactly. of yourself. Exactly. So, you know, I think you can kind of say that in the subtle way, but sometimes you just got to have the sign on the door that says, <laughs> this is a no body hate zone. And, you know, there's other ways that we do it. Like, watch, be careful of what pictures we have on the wall and what sort of imagery we're portraying again about, about yoga. And, and I think... There's also the skill in the teacher, I think, in encouraging more interception and more of a felt sense experience of the practice. 
is that we want to keep trying to bring people away from thinking, what do I look like in the pose? You know, but the tricky thing is that we live in a world that is so externalized and the appearance of the body seems more important than just about everything else in lots of, of places that we really have such an opportunity. I think yoga can be the greatest act of body acceptance and body love that we can ever have, that we can ever do if we're doing yoga yoga. If all we're doing is making the shapes and thinking, gee, I hope I look good in this pose and I hope the teacher can see me right now because I am hot in this, right? <laughs> I'm like, sucking it all I in. in. <laughs> it's all in place in this moment. And then, of course, it all usually fall out of the sling or whatever you're doing in that when the ego carries on like that. But we have that real opportunity as teachers, I think, to help people develop a totally different relationship and stance in regard to their bodies. A lot of people live, it's, it's like they're as if they're a meter away from their body, that they're always checking it out, you know, body checking and looking in mirrors and trying to imagine what I think you think I look like. Whereas yoga is really all about the opposite to that, about that kind of lived experience of an internal feeling of living our lives rather than a narrative of what I think it looks like from the outside. But absolutely mm. and it's like the window in if all you've had is the surface imagery and the advertising and even movies and like a lot of literature as well to actually feel into your body often yoga is the first place so we have the space to do that and the guidance mm. into that yeah and it's the most powerful thing about it and it's one of the things that makes me feel the most um, passionate about the importance of having these conversations with yoga teachers about please don't mess up yoga too. You know, I feel like this body image focus and this objectification of the body and the body beautiful is messing up so many things. Can we not just at least protect yoga from that, you know? And that yoga is not a weight loss tool. It's not a way to shred fat from your body, you know? And, and again, it makes me so unyogically angry when I see yoga teachers saying things like, you know, transform your body and get a yoga six pack. You know, what is that? Maybe six yoga mats in a box. I don't know. <laughs> like, it's, it's just, I think we have to be really careful not to buy in to the message. And, and the questions that students might ask, well, will I use, lose weight doing yoga? Well, I, I think it's really important that we try and change the question. It's, you know, can you have a better relationship with your body and your mind and your other people in your life and your inner self yes absolutely is yoga about weight loss no i don't believe it is and so let's stop trying to sell it like you know another kind of weight loss tool absolutely mm. yeah when i was looking through your website i knew you were a busy woman but it was like four people's jobs <laughs> like director of the Australian Institute of Yoga Therapy, your psychology practice, all the different boards that you're on and all the different study that you're doing and have done in the past. It's like this woman must have some good self-care practices in place to manage all of this. Do you have any kind of things that have really helped you? Like anything you could share with other busy yoga teachers or busy anyone? Yeah, that's an interesting timing question because, uh, you know, to be really honest, I am a work in progress and the last couple of months that balance has not been a healthy one. So, you know, we all have our vulnerabilities and one of my vulnerabilities is to take on too much <laughs> uh, and to overdo and to feel too responsible for all the problems in the world. So it's a really interesting challenge because I think for all of us what's important is that we know our vulnerabilities that we recognize when we've stepped into them and then that we put in place the things we need to do to steer back. Realistically, though, I find that the steering back takes time and so I find often when I've dug the hole, it's actually like, oh, bugger, I'm overdoing. <laughs> this is going to take a little while yeah. to come out of it. And But that's okay because I'm coming out of it. But, it, it, you know, even acknowledging that I think is important because you're right, you could remember that what we present on our website and our social media is the best possible version of things, <laughs> right? But in reality, absolutely, I, I often have to be careful about the overdoing. 
So in terms of what at my, I, I guess, you know, I wouldn't for a moment think that I'd sit here and say, oh, yeah, you just do all of these things and you never experience it. Yeah, you just it. schedule it really well, yeah. you know, plan your meals on the weekend. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, and, and, but again, that's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes that's the image of the, the person who's got it all together and figured out that, you know, the reason I'm still on this path is because I've still got a lot to learn, right? Mm-hmm. And I still will be for this, at least this lifetime, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so I feel it's interesting, right, because this really... Really, the last three or four months has been a really challenging time for me in lots of personal ways and business ways. And it's been a time where I've really noticed and had so much kind of respect for the cumulative nature of the well, the reserve that we build through our practice and through our yogic life over time. It's that, you know, yoga is not a reactive It's not, oh, if your life turns to crap, do a bit of yoga and you'll be okay. It's more about the, it's often described that it's a, it's a multivitamin, not an antibiotic. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you build up your resilience over time so that of course we still fall in heap sometimes, but we don't fall, I don't fall as far. And I have the, like a deep innate knowledge that I will be okay even when life is really difficult, that I I've only developed that through yoga. So a faith and a trust in that place in me that is calm and that is strong and that is peaceful and that is capable, all of or that is, you know, all those things that it's easy to think, oh, I wish I could be, but actually I am those things. It's just sometimes I forget them or things get in the way of that. So I guess my best recommendation isn't one that says, oh, well, you do all these things and you don't actually fall sort of sometimes in a bit of a heap. I think more realistically of my humanness and everyone else's humanness that sometimes we overdo, sometimes we grieve, sometimes we do all kinds of things. And we need to honor that. But through our practice over time, we build a deep anchor to that place of okayness that we know is still there even when we're not seeing it. I guess as well that that observant part of your mind that clicks before maybe you do fall in the heap of like, oh, I'm in this pattern again. Yeah. I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And that's absolutely, that's the ideal is that, you know, I think that our practice over time doesn't stop us from still having our vulnerabilities. It just means that maybe we don't go as far down the path before we realize we're on it. You know, <laughs> maybe at step one or two, we're like, oh, oh hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? I thought we were done. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you again. So we see it at one or two rather than seven or eight or nine or ten, hopefully. So, But yeah, so I, I really think that I couldn't sit here and say oh there's a whole bunch of you know how to run your life tools because I think that's really for the individual to reflect on themselves but what I would say that it's the deep well the deep reserve of connection to our authentic self that we build over time that is actually what enables us to do all the things that we want to do and to cope in the times that are difficult. Yeah, that's fantastic mm. advice. Mm. And cooking meals on the weekends helps too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just make some extra, put it yeah. in the freezer. <laughs> this might be a bit of a left turn, but you said you listened to our episode with Karalia Grant yes. on her Kundalini experience, and I was actually wondering what your opinion on, on those sorts of experiences might be from a psychology yeah. pr- perspective, because I, I guess people in the yoga world do sort of seem to experience this a lot. It's an interesting question because I I don't know Karalia and when Mm. I heard that episode I found it really interesting and I don't consider myself an expert in the kind of concept of the Kundalini awakening. Mm -hmm. So I listened to it with the same curiosity that anyone else might. And I still don't, I don't really know because I don't have a kind of context for understanding that through the yoga teachings that Mm -hmm. I've explored. Mm -hmm. It did make me think, though, about there's a chapter in a book called Yoga Psychology by Swami Rama and Rudolf Ballantyne. And the chapter in this book, the title of it is beautiful. The title is Psychosis or Samadhi. Ah, I've heard that phrase. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. and it's like, because that's an interesting question that strikes me. That's probably what it's kind of like, right? Mm. And my feeling about the difference. From, but again, this is not an expert opinion, but it got me thinking about it after that episode. I wonder whether what happens when we're having a more enlightened experience or a breakthrough uh, experience that some people might call a kundalini type experience, 
I think that those kind of experiences, from what I've heard about them, when people talk about them and have never had one, is that they're actually more unifying and they're about experiencing our oneness. Whereas I think that some of the things that people might refer to as more of a breakdown as opposed to a breakthrough and more whether we'd call it psychosis or um, mental breakdowns, whatever, one of the characteristics often of those experiences is a feel is the opposite. It's total isolation and a feeling of being totally different to everybody else. We all feel that on some level, but a feeling of total isolation and removal from humanity that experience worries me more when I hear of people having those kind of experiences, a mental health professional. We all have aspects of that at times in our lives, but when we totally separate ourselves from our humanness, when the ego self, you know, separates us from the more kind of the unified consciousness, then that's, that's terrifying. And I think can be sort of, it's a crisis for a human being. So that's kind of as far as I've got in my thinking about it. I think it's a great conversation, though, and I'd love to hear more people's thoughts on it because I think it's very interesting. What's the difference? It's, to people outside any spiritual traditions, what we're talking about, anything to do with these awakened experiences, could easily all be seen as just losing your mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which still is, but in a different way. Yeah. Like, I think that's actually a difference, too. It's like maybe are we moving to a deeper level of self, and deeper level of our understanding of the nature of existence or do we feel like we're removing ourselves from our fundamental humanity and I think that sounds a lot more problematic to me than the first version mm. so I think that's a I love that you're asking people that question though it feels like it's a really sort of interesting reflection that I don't uh, yeah I don't know there's easy answers to it it's a yeah, it's a good uh, inquiry I think Mm, and like we know a couple of people who it's happened to and they weren't yogis mm. and it didn't happen in a yoga context mm. and so without even that yoga philosophy framework which at least gives you some kind of context for what might be happening like it's like it just seems to be happening to more and more mm. people mm. uninvited so yeah I reckon it's definitely something that I do want to share more out loud so if mm. anyone mm. listening has had that experience and being too terrified to tell anyone, like they're not alone, like this yeah. is something that happens. Yeah. You know what I'd say though is even with those experiences, I think it's important that we still don't assume a uniformality. That's true. Yes. In the, in the same way that I said before about all oh, depression is not the same, mm. that, because of what could happen if we're not careful is a couple of people could say, well, this is what it is and this is what happens. But that I don't think any experience is ever the same yeah. for any two people. There might be similar aspects but I know it's easier if we can un say an experience is the same and yeah, this you is know, this exactly yeah. we can name mm. it we can label it we can familiarize it but actually I think we should never lose the individual humanity kind of that we we each manifest things in a different way so I think that's the other tricky part about this conversation yeah because mm. I would also as you know as a mental health professional I'd never make a judgment about whether something sounds like a kind of healthy transcendence or an unhealthy kind of breakdown I'd never make that assessment without actually assessing the individual person mm. and from your professional standpoint yeah, yeah. Because I think it's it's really, yeah, it could be so many different things, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. I feel you may already have answered this because so many of your answers have come back to this central theme. But is there one overriding thing that someone, say someone went to a class with you, someone had a session with you, is there a key philosophy you'd like to impart? Like what is the, mm. the heart of what you teach and what you do. I'd love you to ask that to a whole bunch of my clients and see what the answer is. Because it's, you know, we think there's the stuff we think we know about ourselves and then there's what other people experience about us. But I guess my strongest response to that is that I think what's really important is that we allow ourselves to gravitate towards the aspects of our lives that help us strengthen our own inner wisdom and our own inner teacher and our own inner therapist that I think the yoga teaching that I respect the most and the psychotherapy that I respect the most, uh, both equally, are about helping people return to the pure wisdom, goodness, light, whatever we want to call it, pure self in them that is already there. I don't believe that either yoga or psychology are about changing or transforming people 
in a way that is about helping them be someone different. It's more about helping people bring to the surface their light. So the psychologist, early psychologist Carl Jung used to talk about our light and our shadow. The light is there even when it is behind the shade. And sometimes it's a long way behind the shade. There's a lot of shade. (laughs) But I think that it's really important and so helpful to speak as a yoga teacher that teachers recognize that this is not about us doing anything to a person or it's not about, you know, we, we actually kind of need to take our own ego identity out of the equation. That really good teaching, good therapy, I believe, um, is about helping people return to that which is already there in them. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Pick of the week. I had trouble stopping at one. Oh, you can have as many bucks as you like. Can I? Okay. Yeah. 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 So the first one is my very dear friend, Lucy Karnani. Lucy is a yoga teacher and communication expert. Uh, And Lucy and her dear friend, Jill Danks, another uh, communications expert and coach, they are just about to release a book called Connecting, and it's about conscious communication for yoga teachers. Oh, Mm. so good. Fantastic. (laughs) And I was fortunate to be one of their early readers of the book and this is a must read I think for all yoga teachers and really a useful book for all human beings and they will be launching that book at segue into my second recommendation which is the Yoga Australia conference oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is coming up in March in the middle of March and I'll be speaking at the Yoga Australia conference and will you guys be there not this year oh, I'm sure. no, no, no. Well, you'll be there in, in spirit we'll yeah. be thinking yes. of you so the Yoga Australia conference is always just a beautiful amazing wonderful experience so I look forward to seeing people there that's my next recommendation and the third one is I hope it's not totally rude to do a little plug no you <laughs> <laughs> the yoga psychology workshops that I run with Michael Demanacor, we run them both for yoga teachers is one group of the trainings we run to help yoga teachers develop their skills and understanding in, in kind of responding to the mental health challenges of our students, which we know is a lot of people. And we also run them for mental health professionals to help mental health professionals learn about the psychology in yoga. So we've got, I think May is our next workshop for yoga teachers here in Melbourne and then in Sydney later in the year. So that's that's just on the yogapsychology.com.au website. So that's my little shameless self Oh, no, fantastic. <laughs> and I feel like you've already said so much great advice on mm. the yoga for mental health great. sphere. Great. That, yeah, I think everyone will want to come to your workshops. Oh, good, good. Yes. Well, it's actually great. And working with Michael Domenico is fabulous. And Michael's extraordinary knowledge and application of the Yoga Sutras. It's just a really interesting weave in between the things we've been talking about today. And then Michael keeps referencing it back into the sutras, which is just fabulous. It's really... Yeah, it's, oh. it's great working with him. Fantastic. Yeah. Sorry. So my one is just a treat for your eyes. I have found this new Instagram account that I love. Uh, it's Philippa Stanton, and the account is number five, F-T-I-N-F, and I'll put the link. And she's a photographer, and she has synesthesia, and she paints. So a lot of her photographs, that is one which is jasmine and then she used paint to depict the smells of the jasmine so it's beautiful yellows and purples or she'll do things like just arrange a whole lot of objects on her wooden table but all of the objects are like periwinkle blue and tangerine orange and it's like a palette cleanser for your brain it's beautiful oh man i'm on that straight away this afternoon and uh, can i just add a fourth one to yes. my list then because that reminded me another thing i was going to say it's not really a pick of the week it's almost a recommendation clean up your social media get rid of images that make you feel bad about yourself or bad about your body or bad about your life just get rid of them gone blocked exited whatever and put more of the beautiful stuff we need more beauty in our lives so that is such a perfect kind of reminder thank you 90 percent of my instagram is pictures of plants (laughs) yeah mine's puppies yeah My pick of the week is Spotify. I've only signed up recently to it, but I'm actually really loving how it'll actually start preparing playlists based on your history, and they're actually turning out to be incredibly accurate (laughs) in what I like. Wow. So that's really good. And the other thing I like is that it knows your friends, and you can actually watch what they're playing. Which I think (laughs) is creepy. (laughs) Which is a little bit creepy, but then you can go, oh, I want to play that. And you can say, I didn't realize you were into Barry Manilow. Yeah. (laughs) run friend who just plays like jolly hip-hop so yeah, yeah. Just, if i want to feel a bit uplifted i just go to that person's <laughs> spotify playlist and yeah i'm set so yeah that's my pick of the week i love that you guys are so into 
the senses. It's your creative, artistic yeah. kind of selves. Yeah. And technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really nice. Thanks so much. Thank you for, so um, much, Janet. It's so wonderful to talk to you. I've, I've learned so much from that. So. Me too. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you to both of you for what you're doing. You know, I think anyone who's out in the world trying to spread the good stuff, I feel grateful for your sharing and your generosity and contribution to, to me and everyone else who's listening. So oh, it's our pleasure. You. We get to talk to amazing people. Yeah. It's fantastic. Wow. 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 We get to learn so yeah. much. Yeah. Likewise, this is fun. Any time. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. That was a great conversation. We covered so much and the time really flew by. Janet is an amazing and extremely down-to-earth individual. It was great to have the opportunity to talk with her. Now, just before we leave you, I'd like to ask that you subscribe or rate us on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. It will really help us get the word out there. We really want to share this podcast with the world. Finally, we would really love to hear from you. If you've got any questions about the podcast or just want to drop us a line, you can drop us a note at our website at podcast.flowartist.com or look for us on Facebook or Twitter. The theme song in this podcast is Baby Robots by Go Soul and used with permission. Do yourself a favor and get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thanks again. Big, big love. <laughs>